name is Jeremy Wakeford and I'm representing the Association for the Study of Peak Oil, South Africa. And today we're going to talk to you about this phenomenon called peak oil and explain what it means and what the implications are for us here in South Africa. So the outline of today's presentation is as follows. Firstly, we're going to establish our addiction to oil. Then, we're going to look at some assumptions that most people have about oil and contrast this with reality in a number of reality checks. Thirdly, we'll look at the global implications of peak oil. Then we'll narrow the focus to South Africa and look at the implications for us here. And finally, we'll look at how we can respond to this situation. So, the world is addicted to oil, as George W. Bush famously said in 2006. One third of the world's primary energy supply is delivered by oil. Other contributions come from natural gas at 21% and coal at about 26%. So more than 80% of the world's primary energy supply comes from fossil fuels. In contrast, renewables like solar, wind and geothermal energy currently provide less than 1% of the world's energy supply. So we've got a long way to go in transitioning away from fossil fuels. 95% of the world's transport systems are fueled by oil. And this is one of the really critical uh, dependencies that we have on oil. Oil powers industrial agriculture. We literally eat fossil fuels. A whole host of petrochemical products are made from oil, ranging from toothpaste and toothbrushes to pharmaceuticals to plastics to shirts. Assumption number one is that business as usual will prevail. We'll see continued growth in economies, in populations, in rates of urbanization, etc. But can this continue indefinitely? An economist called Kenneth Boulding once said that anyone who believes that exponential growth can continue indefinitely on a finite planet is either a madman or an economist. Reality check number one. There are a whole number of warning signs that our growth is unsustainable. We have financial volatility, climate change, resource depletion, biodiversity loss, the destruction of forests and fisheries, soil degradation, deforestation, and fossil fuel depletion. And we're just going to look at fossil fuel depletion today. Clearly, we'll see that our path is unsustainable. Assumption number two is that there's plenty of oil left. Companies like BP like to tell us that we have 40 years worth of oil at current rates of consumption. However, with oil, we're not going to drive along merrily and then suddenly fall off a cliff. Rather, oil production in any region, be it a small producing country uh, or a large continent or even an individual field, starts at zero, rises up to a certain level, reaches a maximum, and after some time declines towards zero. That's a simple mathematical fact because of oil being a finite resource. So when you add up the production profiles from a number of individual fields or small regions, it traces out a roughly bell-shaped curve. And that is the phenomenon that we refer to as peak oil. The peak being the maximum rate of oil extraction. Now this is clearly evident if you look at some large oil producing regions like the lower continental United States, 48 states. Their discoveries of oil peaked in the 1930s and 40 years later we had a peak in the production of oil in 1970 and since then oil production has been declining year after year despite phenomenal increases in uh, technology and episodes of really high oil prices which are supposed to stimulate increasing supply. North America as a whole reached its peak oil production in 1985. Europe peaked in year 2000 and has been declining at a rate of about 6 to 7 percent a year since then. Most individual oil producing countries are already past their peaks, in fact about three quarters of them. Assumption number three is that markets will solve the problem. When the oil prices rise, we'll simply find more oil. Reality check three. Globally, oil discoveries peaked in the 1960s and have been on a declining trend ever since. If we look at the history of world oil production, we see that in the 1950s and 60s, there was a huge increase in the rate of oil production and consumption. An economist termed this time 
the golden age, which was the, recorded the highest rates of economic growth in our history. Then in the 1970s, there were two large oil shocks in 1973 and 1979, both of which derailed the global economy for a couple of years. Since then, oil production has increased again, although not as fast as in the 50s and 60s, until once again interrupted in 2008 by another oil shock and the resulting Great Recession. Now if we zoom in on just the last few years of production, we see that oil production essentially reached a plateau in around 2004 and has been within a 5% range since then. This leveling off in the rate of production of oil globally goes a long way towards explaining the increase in prices that we've seen since 2004. Essentially, supply has been static, whereas demand in countries like China and India has been growing very rapidly. Oil consumption in OPEC countries, the oil exporting countries, has increased by about 2 million barrels a day in the last few years. Whereas in the rich countries, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, oil consumption has declined by several million barrels a day. So we've seen a shifting in consumption from west to east. Now, what happens in the future? How long does this oil plateau last? Well, we don't know for certain. But most of the experts are now saying that we can't increase oil production much from where we are now, and that within about two to five years, we're going to start to drop off the other side of the oil peak. And in fact, if you look at world oil exports, which is the amount of oil put onto the markets for sale to importing countries like South Africa, then the amount of oil peaked in 2005 and has been declining since then. At the same time, we've been seeing rising marginal cost of oil production. So as oil companies have to go to more extreme locations to find oil, such as the Gulf of Mexico, deep offshore wells and even polar regions or Canadian tar sands, the costs of extracting this oil rises over time. A related concept is the energy return on energy invested. This tells us how much energy we get out after investing a certain amount of energy in, for instance, drilling equipment, in exploration and in refining oil. Now in the 1930s, for every one barrel of oil equivalent that was invested in the oil extraction and refining industry, about a hundred barrels of oil were delivered. That's a phenomenal rate of return. Since then, the energy return on investment has been declining steadily, reaching about 30 to 1 in the 1970s and about 15 to 1 in the last few years. Thank you.